All right. Well, uh, let's see. Dr. Beasley and Chalmers, do you feel as we're ready to get started? Can I go ahead and introduce you? I think so. All right. Well, welcome, everybody. Um, this is Medical Informatics Grand Rounds uh, for the month of November. And um, I'm Blake Lusselroth. I'm the vice chair in the Department of Medical Informatics. Um, and today I have the great privilege of introducing two wonderful speakers, Drs. Brent Beasley and Laura Chalmers. Um, today they're going to be talking about um, their work in diabetes, but this is going to be an interesting talk because I, as a clinician, am going to learn quite a bit about what's state-of-the-art care and what we should be doing as practitioners to make sure that we're delivering the highest quality. But also, if you're not a direct um, clinical provider, this should be of great interest to you because uh, both of these folks are actually doing a, an amazing service in trying to transform how we deliver care across the state of Oklahoma. So let me give you a little bit of an introduction about uh, both of them. I'll start with Dr. Beasley. So Dr. Beasley, whom I know quite well, uh, he's a professor of medicine in the Department of Internal Medicine here in Tulsa, and also the George Kaiser Family Foundation Chair um, uh, in internal, uh, the co-chair in internal medicine, um, or excuse me, the vice chair of internal medicine. Um, and he's now taken on a new role, which is really exciting. He's also co-director of OFIC, that's the Oklahoma Primary Healthcare Improvement Collaborative. Um, he, um, he's received his MD uh, in Tulsa back in 92. Uh, he's been a medical educator for 25 years. And uh, while his bio sketch simply says medical educator, I may add to that master educator, um, because in my experience working with him, he's been a phenomenal force for good uh, in the Department of Medicine, Internal Medicine here in Tulsa, um, not only basically raising the sort of new heights in terms of quality and care delivery, but also being a phenomenal mentor for other faculty, residents, and students. Um, he, he developed uh, his expertise in healthcare quality improvement through a fellowship at the Institute of Healthcare Delivery at Intermountain Healthcare in Salt Lake City in 2012. He was also the CEO of St. Luke's Physician Specialist, Specialist in Kansas City from 2014 to 2016. We were very, very lucky to recruit him back to Oklahoma in 2016. And since that time, he's been medical director of our internal medicine clinic. Um, and he uh, recently stepped down from that role to take on an even greater challenge, which is as co-director of the uh, Oklahoma um, Primary Healthcare Improvement Collaborative. And for those of you that aren't familiar with it, he'll probably tell you a bit more, but simply stated, it's, a, it's an implementation uh, team that spans both of our campuses in Tulsa and Oklahoma City, and it's dedicated to improving the delivery of care services in um, primary care across the state of Oklahoma, uh, which means uh, a heavy investment in implementation work, uh, academic detailing, providing leadership, uh, and securing additional funding from, nat from national organizations to uh, fill gaps in our research and what works best to transform care in the community. Um, so I'm very excited to have him present today. He's joined by Laura Chalmers. Laura Chalmers is a pediatric and adult endocrinologist. She's at the Harold Hamm Oklahoma Diabetes Center and is an associate professor at the OU School of Community Medicine. Uh, together, they're going to be talking today about diabetes as well as the work that they're doing to try to um, spread best practices across the state. Um, so it's my distinct privilege and pleasure to uh, ask uh, Brent to go ahead and get us started. Um, and uh, hopefully, um, if we stay on track at the end of the session, we should have some time for Q&A. But uh, over to you, Brent. Thanks a lot. I appreciate that, Blake. Um, and I'm really thankful that Laura's joining me, joining me today. So let me give you a little bit of <laughs> update about how this all came about. So OFIC, as Blake was talking about, is designed to help rural for the most part, rural offices all across Oklahoma. We have we have uh, non-rural as well, but uh, we want to make sure that all across the state of Oklahoma, we're able to work with uh, practices to try to make sure that the the care is um, uh, up to date uh, and and uh, value added at the point of care, um, no matter what county uh, our our clinicians are practicing in. So to that end, one of the things that became clear to me uh, over the last couple of years is a lot has changed and a lot is happening in diabetes. And it was really um, uh, hard for me to keep up with it overall. And so as we brought on a new, um, a, a new uh, initiative within OFIC uh, that is 
really an extension of that very first OPIC initiative called H2O, where we really worked on trying to improve cardiovascular care for patients all across the board. Uh, one of the things uh, with this, uh, with a new grant that came along was to take uh, that H2O pro uh, project, Healthy Hearts for Oklahoma, and increase um, the, the number of um, uh, diseases that it was focused on, which mainly included diabetes. The first one, the first project uh, was looking at aspirin use, uh, blood pressure, and cholesterol. And we really saw great changes across Oklahoma when that was initiated. This new project takes it up a little bit uh, more and is focused on diabetes within uh, cardiovascular disease. And as, it, as I pursued that, I, I realized how much I had not kept up with diabetes care. As a primary care doctor, it's really hard to know everything. And so we, we often get into routines where we just haven't um, learned the, the best or the latest uh, uh, medicine that's, that's out there to know. And so to that end, not only did I wanna bring updates from the guidelines, I wanted to bring an endocrinologist with us uh, who can provide perspective. And, and that's one of the things as a primary care doc, sometimes we don't have is we don't know the details um, of what's going on uh, in the subspecialties. And so I asked Dr. Chalmers if she'd be with us today and walk through this. So again, this is as a part of our H2O Plus initiative, o OPIC would like to provide our clinicians a CME program, especially designed for them. Since the initial H2O project began more than five years ago, there have been significant changes in the research behind secondary cardiovascular disease prevention. In addition, we know diabetes is one of the major drivers of vascular disease, so its prevention and treatment are critical. In this CME module, we'll review the changes impacting secondary prevention of cardiovascular disease, and in addition, the latest recommendations for type 2 diabetes prevention and treatment. So our objectives are to review the American Diabetes Association 2020 recommendations for providing care to diabetes patients, and one of the things you'll see about those recommendations is it's really focused on uh, healthcare delivery. And then we're also gonna look at the re and review the 2019 American Association of Clini Clinical Endocrinologists, American College of Endocrinology, comprehensive type two diabetes management algorithm. And that's really gonna be focused on the medicines and uh, kind of that best care right at the point of care. So we are gonna look at first with the, the health systems then we're going to get down and focus really on, uh, on uh, those practical uh, management decisions you make in the office. And then we want to learn more about the evidence base for diabetes prevention programs, the diabetes self-management education support programs, and the medication therapy uh, management programs. So for this CME mo module, uh, as I said, we'll be using the ADA Standards of Medical Care and Diabetes that we released in 2020. And the ADA developed their own evaluation system for grading the strength of the evidence behind their guidelines and recommendations for all new and revised ADA position statements. Each are graded as A, B, or C, depending on the type of studies reviewed. Grade A recommendations are developed from very large clinical trials with incontrovertible results and from meta-analyses. The studies which provide confidence that the results will be most applicable to our patients. Lower level recommendations are not as well supported. B recommendations are derived from well-conducted large cohort studies. And C recommendations are based on supportive evidence from poorly controlled or uncontrolled studies, but which are often valuable. And then grade E recommendations will be based on just expert consensus or clinical experience as we go forward. Finally, it's critical also to assess diabetes health, excuse me, uh, here we are. Uh, to begin with, the standards of medical care and diabetes lead us to ensure treatment decisions are timely, rely on evidence-based guidelines, and are made collaboratively with patients based on individual preference, prognoses, and comorbidities. As we will see within this document, it will be vital to tailor our decisions to each patient's clinical characteristics, such as chronic kidney disease, obesity, cardiovascular disease, 
and even their long-term prognosis, recommending less tight control based on patients' expected potential mortality. Next, we must align our approaches to diabetes management with the chronic care model, which emphasizes person-centered team care approaches, integrated long-term treatment methodologies for diabetes and other comorbidities, and ongoing collaborative communication and goal setting between all team members. Care systems should facilitate a team-based care model that allows each care team member to practice to the top of their license, utilizes patient registries to identify those missing key recommendations or whose chronic diseases are poorly controlled, and utilizes decision support tools and integrates community involvement to meet patients' needs. So as I'm going through this, I wanna stop real quick and just check in with Dr. Chalmers is this something that you're seeing uh, put in place uh, across the board in diabetes care and a lot of the different practices that you've seen, Dr. Chalmers? Yes. So on uh, the six core elements in diabetes care management, the six core elements are recommended by the ADA for optimal diabetes care management are grounded by a five-year population-based and propensity match cohort study of 26,000 patients enrolled in a multidisciplinary risk assessment and management program identified as RAMP-DM to determine their effect on preventing diabetes-related complications and health service utilization. Those six core elements include number one, an optimal delivery system that moves from a reactive to a proactive care delivery system where planned visits are coordinated through a team-based approach. Second, the utilization of diabetes self-management education and support provides patients a knowledge and tools to own their diabetes care. And number three, the utilization of decision support tools grounded in evidence-based effective care guidelines provides a clinician with just-in-time recommendations. The fourth element would include the deployment of clinical information systems, such as registries that we mentioned before, that provide patient-specific and population-based support to the care team. The fifth key component are community resources and policies to identify or develop resources to support healthy lifestyles, such as dietitians, food as medicine classes, community sport groups, exercise classes. And finally, that sixth element needed for the true health systems. Again, these are focused on the health systems designed to create quality oriented culture, well integrated with facile communication, patient navigators, and laser focus on the patient's needs. So Dr. Chalmers, can you tell us a little bit about how you see this taking place in your own clinic? Um, I mean, I think the biggest thing with all of this that's going on, which I think is very important, is, is you know, here we have a good um, self-management program that we can get patients into to get the best education. And so I think, you know, I wish the rest of the community has as much access to do that, because I think that's probably the biggest thing with, you know, getting success in, for patients and long-term control. So on those on delivery system design, let's start with looking and thinking about it as a football team that has well rehearsed plays. So clinics caring for diabetic patients require protocols for staff that empower them to work at the top of their licensures. This would include prepping a patient for a chronic disease management visit. One key is having a staff perform medication reconciliation to ensure medications and instructions are current and up to date and that the patient has plenty of refills for the following year. Likewise, routine referrals such as yearly ophthalmology visits can be ordered by staff when a medical director or a supervising physician has provided written directions to do so. Using protocols for required point of care testing such as the HbA1c every three months or for yearly cholesterol in routine referrers such as the PPOD, and that was a new term I hadn't heard before, but I thought it was kind of cool, the pharmacy, podiatry, optometry, and dentistry, and using triggered referrals for diabetes prevention programs, diabetes self-management education support programs, 
and medication therapy management, about which we're gonna speak about in more detail. So Dr. Chalmers, it sounds like you've used some of these uh, support programs yourself. Have you seen them valuable for your patients in getting those A1Cs under control? I definitely think it's helpful, especially having the diabetes educator. What I do notice that I have at um, the Cherokee clinics that I go to is they already have, you know, the the nurse who supervises and makes sure that the patients are getting their labs, their dental exams, their eye exams, you know, getting them set up for podiatry, which is something that would be beneficial for us to be able to get in place at OU because it's it, you know, it guarantees that they're going to have, you know, the care that they need for all aspects of their diabetes-related complications. And, and to that end, uh, the, the, it takes a load off the clinician's shoulders feeling like they have to do it all and they have to remember it all. So having those, Definitely. Protocols, having those protocols in place uh, are, are extremely important. So thinking about that delivery system design, Assigning complicated patients to case managers within the practice is synonymous to the way a hospital provides a critical care unit for highly complex patients. A small group of nurses or counselors provide care uh, as to a select group of patients with high risk situations and diagnoses. These patients may be identified through the use of registries that track lab values and clinical data such as blood pressures, Care managers are assigned to ensure the patients have frequent routine visits, updated medication refills, targeted referrals for the high-risk diagnoses, and co contract contracting uh, patients in transition from a hospital or urgent care, excuse me, contacting, contacting patients in transition from a hospital or urgent care visit to have follow-up with their PCPs and providing them those just-in-time radiology and lab values from these healthcare experiences. Uh, and just as a comment, so often it seems like uh, in between the hospital and the primary care office, a lot of this all gets dropped. And it's really nice when you have a care manager, someone that's assigned to be tracking that down for the, for the patient's visit uh, when that's coming up. Um, all of the above are elements required of practices who obtain certification as a patient-centered medical home. Now, I know that uh, some of the practices in Tulsa are, are certified. I know our OU practices here are certified in patient-centered medical home model, um, but that may be valuable for any practice out there that haven't uh, gone down that pathway of looking into uh, becoming a PCMH. Um, such practices provide comprehensive primary care, use a patient-centered approach, coordinate the care for patients and paneled in the practice, ensure the services that are offered are accessible and certify the care provided is high quality and safe. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the diabetes prevention programs. And for some folks out there, this may be a new notion. A diabetes prevention program is for patients with prediabetes defined as having an A1C between 5.7 and 6.4. The diabetes prevention program trial demonstrated that an intensive lifestyle intervention could reduce the incidence of type 2 diabetes by 58% over three years, which is really huge. That was uh, shown uh, in follow-up of three large studies of lifestyle interventions for diabetes prevention uh, in the rate of conversion to type 2 diabetes, a 39% reduction at 30 years in the Da King diabetes prevention study a 43% reduction at seven years in the Finnish Diabetes Prevention Study, and a 34% reduction at 10 years, and 27% reduction at 15 years in the U.S. Diabetes Prevention Program Outcome Study. So Dr. Chalmers, is, have you been enrolling your patients in diabetes prevention programs, and what are the outcomes that you're seeing from that? So on the adult side, no, on, you know, I deal a lot with kids for prevention, um, you know, and we try to have, you know, dietary education here. And then also we try to get them in with like the Eli clinic who has, you know, physical therapy and exercise programs. And I think if we can get patients engaged in continuing to follow up with those programs, you know, I think we can actually make some headway with it. 
I, I was able to get some information from uh, one of our colleagues at SWASU, and this is a slide that's provided by Amy Henderson, who's a PharmD that works with them. And this is looking at their diabetes prevention framework and the Oklahoma data that they have. So the goals, again, are to prevent that type 2 diabetes through that nutritional and fitness skills that Dr. Chalmers is talking about, the coping mechanisms for emotions and the environments, and teaching overall health and wellness. They work on implementing SMART goals, uh, and, and I think everybody out there probably is aware of the SMART, what that stands for, SMART goals for slow, sustainable, individualized behavior changes, setting six months goals. Their six months goal would have a five to 7% weight loss and that the patient would engage in 150 minutes of weekly exercise. And the structure uh, is a 12 month CDC approved curriculum. So their program is actually approved by the CDC a minimum of 22 sessions, dialogue based with brainstorming and problem solving to personalize strategies. They have quality insurance that has to be built in on these programs to be certified with biannual data submission to the CDC's Diabetes Prevention and Recognition Program. And in Oklahoma, I didn't know this, but we have 18 fully recognized programs in Oklahoma. However, look at that bottom line. It's utilized by less than 1% of Oklahomans with diabetes. And accessibility is increasing with state plans, the Health Choice, and Blue Cross, Blue Shield, HMO, Global Health HMO, and Medicare benefit coverage. So groups are recognizing the benefit of this. Obviously, if we put our money into preventing diabetes, we're going to save a lot of money in medicine on the back end. <clears throat> So this is about diabetes self-management education programs. And again, this was new to me to learn about these. For patients with A1Cs who are over nine, that's who we're targeting. Systematic reviews have demonstrated they improve knowledge and attitude scores. It significantly decreases the A1C levels in participants. The self-management education programs provide support for patients on multiple levels, not just the medication adherence, but also dietary recommendations, exercise advice, and encouragement using behavior change models and providing social support. They also help patients learn to use technology-enabled devices to improve their medication adherence and blood sugar tracking, which really is a great help for clinicians caring for them. So Dr. Chalmers, have you um, had any of your patients participate in, in uh, diabetes self-management education programs and what are you seeing? So, I mean, any of our newly diagnosed patients all go through our, our self-management programs. Um, and it's important, especially with our patients with type one, to know how to take care of them, their selves when they're sick and how to help prevent hospitalizations. And I think if they have a better understanding of how to manage them, you know, themselves, they do much better long term and, you know, and actually help educate other people out there in the community about how to take care of diabetes more appropriately. So in, in using these self-management education programs for patients uh, with an A1C over nine is a considered a best practice and systematic reviews demonstrate these programs improve patients' knowledge and attitudes about their disease. Not only the knowledge improved, but the programs has significantly led to decreased A1C levels in participants. Self-management education programs provide support for patients on multiple levels, not just medication adherence, but also dietary recommendation, exercise advice, and encouraging using behavior change models. So this is something that I've, I've uh, become very interested in and really hope that we can help our rural practices begin to access some of these programs. Because one of the things we're seeing is they're coming online now. Some of these uh, programs have been able to develop uh, online services. Then uh, again, um, looking at some of the uh, Oklahoma data. So this was again provided by one of our colleagues. So, so this was Amy Henderson again goals with patient empowerment, providing tools for informed decisions, implementing those SMART goals for sustainable behavior change, collaboration with the healthcare team, so back and forth communication between the primary care doc uh, and, and their uh, DME, DSMES program, 
to improve those outcomes and health status. And the structure, again, these are ADCES accredited or ADA accredited recognized programs. And that re requires that ongoing uh, uh, quality control uh, and annual data that they're submitting. They teach those self-care behaviors, healthy eating, active lifestyle, reducing risk, monitoring, taking meds, healthy coping, problem solving. And the link varies on patient needs and the provider referral. So it really depends on us as the primary care docs referring our patients there. And referral required for insurance coverage. Uh, so the patient really can't just go about it themselves. Uh, they really do need that referral from us, the primary care docs. And in the Oklahoma data, there are 58 DSMES accredited or recognized sites in Oklahoma, 28 of those tribal and 30 are general. And they're only used though by 4% of those with diabetes in Oklahoma. So I think we really have an, an opportunity here to make a difference in our patients uh, by trying to get them referred to these programs. So in fact, a summer 2020 press release shows seven leading diabetes organizations issued a consensus report highlighting the value of diabetes, self-management education and support services as part of a comprehensive diabetes medical care. The report provides compelling evidence for the need for increased utilization of diabetes self-management education and support, four key times that it's most beneficial and specific recommendations for both clinicians and health systems to increase access to and participate in these services. And it's co-authored by the ADA, the Association of Diabetes Care and Education Specialists, all of these different organizations are recommending it. So the last one we're gonna to touch base on is also a, was a new one to me that I was not familiar with until I started looking at, at the ADA recommendations and that's medication therapy management. So it's a help for patients and their clinicians uh, with a consult. Sometimes we know it's difficult for patients with diabetes to understand and manage multiple medications. They come to me with a sack of medications. They'll have sometimes 10 or 15 different medications in their sack. And also in there are, will be herbal remedies and uh, over-the-counter medications. Um, sometimes up to 10 medications when they're diabetic, just you know, for their blood pressure, their diabetes, their cholesterol, uh, all these things. And when they have heart disease included, they may be on two or three more, including aspirin. So in randomized controlled trials, a pharmacist provided medication therapy management service has contributed to improved blood pressure control in diabetic patients and has reduced the risk for major cardiovascular events by 21% when compared to usual practice. You know, I always think that as a primary care doctor, I can do it all myself. What we need is a team. We need to be reaching out to these other services and making sure that we, we are using uh, what's best practice for our patients. So not only that, studies have shown a drop in the A1C by more than a half a percentage point. And that's a drop that's as good as some common diabetic medications that could deliver. So when we talk about adding on a new diabetic medication, we're usually looking at maybe one percentage point difference with each diabetes medication that's added maybe less than that, but maybe up to a point. So the fact that it was able to drop the A1C by uh, more than half a point, I was impressed about. So the next part we wanna to touch base on is clinical decision support tools. And this was another recommendation from the ADA. So such as the diabetes wizard, this is, this is one example from an EMR. It is not the EMR that I use. The EMR that we use don't, doesn't have any uh, diabetes decision support uh, contained in it. But some of these, uh, some of them will come with the diabetes uh, support. Sometimes you can add on diabetes uh, support. In OFIC, we want to be looking into how we can help our practices uh, get this type of diabetes decision support. So the diabetes wizard shown above when up to date with current evidence can provide clinicians with valuable just in time and patient specific recommendations to improve the patient care. In one study, a sizable group of small to medium sized independent primary care practices in Delaware participating in a statewide collaborative, similar to what we have in Oklahoma, were enrolled in a prospective one year cluster randomized longitudinal study to determine the efficacy 
of a clinical decision support tool that was based on ADA guidelines in a real world envi environment. And I was impressed by this. I, I was um, glad to see that we are moving uh, in this direction. Is that something, uh, Dr. Chalmers, that you've seen used, or is that anything that you have used in your practice? I have not, and I was not aware of EMRs that did that, so this is actually kind of exciting. It, yeah, it is exciting because it, it's really getting complex, and we're going to show you once we get uh, past the ADA guidelines into the endocrinology guidelines about how complex it can be, and it would be nice if there were ways to make that easy. So we're going to be looking uh, for our clinicians and ways to, uh, to do that. So this was patients who received guideline-directed care from their clinicians were more likely to achieve their personalized A1C goal, more likely to achieve an A1C less than 7%, and more likely to achieve an LDL cholesterol level less than 100. So that's what we're wanting to get to. That comes from the DECIDE study. So touch base on clinical information system, uh, systems. The ADA also places a high priority on the use and integration of clinical information systems within the practice. The primary tool in this category are registries. And we keep talking about this in OPIC, registries, registries, registries. Every one of our practices um, is being educated and taught develop registries to guide the, uh, the care uh, managers within the practices to be using those registries, identifying patients who are at high risk, patients who have high A1C levels, patients who have high LDL levels, uh, using those registries on, on a regular routine basis to identify and intervene early. So not waiting till the patient actually comes in for a visit, but intervening early uh, when, we, when we are using those registries. Um, using the registries that provide patient-specific and population-based support to the care team helps prioritize which patients need increased support and, sp and specialized services. For instance, keeping, as we were talking about, a current list of patients A1Cs helps identify patients with poor control whose treatment could be augmented or who might benefit from medication therapy management and diabetes self-management uh, self education programs. Similarly, a registry of patients LDL helps to ensure the diabetic patients are a goal for cardiovascular prevention. The clinicians could use the cardiovascular risk calculators that are out there that are freely available uh, on the internet to determine a patient's individual risk and goals. Adding the patient's cardiovascular risk and their medications such as statins and aspirin to the registry allows a case manager to quickly sort and review in order to make focused calls and send needed prescriptions under the authorization of the medical director's office policies. So keeping a list of patients who need optometry exams and foot exams allows the staff who room the patients to refer patients for these services, again, when the medical director has authorized such a policy. Dr. Chalmers, is that something that you have been able to use within your practices? Have you uh, seen the use of registries and are you, do you have uh, nursing staff that are kind of tracking and helping on that? We do not have that. We do have within our EMR right now, you know, we do track eye exams when they're done, but like yearly labs and all of that is left up primarily to the provider. And it's, if we had a, you know, a nurse to supervise that, I'm sure we do a lot better on making sure we're getting everything that's recommended. Absolutely. So looking at community resources and policies, Clinicians and their staff should work together to identify diabetes prevention programs, diabetes self-management education and support services, medication therapy management services, and facilitating referrals to these, even keeping their cards available and maintaining loose professional affiliations with the leaders of these services. Providing or starting diabetes support groups where patients can share their experiences and learn from another is another way that can be helpful and finding community leaders and exercise and dietitian services in the community and creating office policies to facilitate referrals to these services is all what this is about. A safety quality oriented culture is what we're trying to develop here that acknowledges the high risk nature of healthcare activities and works to achieve consistently safe work environment, creates a blame free workplace where individuals may report errors or near misses without fear of reprimand or punishment and encourages collaboration across ranks and disciplines to find solutions for patient safety and quality problems. 
So next we're going to be moving into the 2019 AACE and ACE comprehensive diabetes management recommendations. And uh, these uh, again have a lot of complexities and so we're going to depend on Dr. Chalmers to walk us through some of these things. We're going to start with some of the easier ones as we as we go through. So in addition to the guidelines, um, the first one begins with lifestyle modica modification. This would include exercise and diet. Number two, they recommend avoiding hyperglycemia, which can lead to adverse outcomes in our patient. And I know that for me, it, I've noticed that this is becoming more and more of a priority uh, with diabetes patients on all the literature, is that avoidance uh, uh, of hyperglycemia. Their third recommendation is to avoid weight gain. The fourth is to individualize all glycemic tar targets such as the A1C, the fasting plasma glucose, and the postprandial glucose. Their fifth recommendation is to set the A1C optimal target as less than 6.5% or as close to normal as, a safe and, as is safe and achievable. Number six, the therapy choices are affected by the initial A1C the duration of the diabetes, and the patient's obesity status. Recommendation seven is that the choice of therapy must also reflect the patient's cardiac, cerebrovascular, and renal status. The eighth is that the more comorbidities must be managed for comprehensive care. The ninth recommendation is to get the patient to goal as soon as possible, adjusting medications in less than every three months until at goal. Number 10, the choice of therapy includes ease of use and affordability for the patient. And finally, the num number 11 is to choose an A1C goal of less than 6.5% for those on any insulin regimen as long as continuous glucose monitoring is being used. So Dr. Chalmers, anything you want to, any comments you'd like to make on those initial recommendations before we go further? I just think the biggest thing is to remember, I mean, A1C less than 6.5, you know, can be achievable, especially if we can eliminate hypoglycemia because hypoglycemia, I think, causes an adverse effect and patients fear it and end up with high blood sugars. But the other thing is to look at the elderly um, population and try to avoid hypoglycemia with them. And to remember their A1C goal may be more relaxed, like 7.5 or 8, depending on their um, other complications. And just to make sure that, you know, if they're hitting those goals, um, make sure you keep them encouraged. Perfect. Thank you. So how are these guidelines complementary when you look at these two? So again, the ADA recommendations focus on the health systems and office management. The AACE, ACE guidelines uh, focus more on the treatment at the level of the patient. And implementing really one without the other overlooks critical pieces that are required for patient care. So um, kind of drilling down on these uh, major guidelines, that first one, maintaining optimal weight, calorie restriction if the BMI is increased, and they also mention a plant-based diet, which I was glad to see. I'm a, I'm a vegan myself, and I did that because of some of my adverse uh, risks in my family history. High polyunsaturated and monounsaturated fatty acids, avoiding trans fatty acids, limiting saturated fatty acids, structured counseling, and meal replacement. And a lot of times I'll recommend my patients the, on the meal replacement, the Jenny Craig or the Weight Watchers, because those are the two that routinely have been studying and shown to be valuable. <clears throat> the other thing to note, and this came out in New England Journal not too long ago, is where they're expecting the prevalence of severe obesity to go. So we look back in 2010 in Oklahoma, you can, I've got it circled there, and you can see that we were already in the 40% range. Moving into 2020, we're getting into 50%, and in 2030, think of this, 60% of our patients may be severe obese, severely obese in Oklahoma. And that's really hard to comprehend because they weren't, it, that wasn't the issue when I was a kid growing up, but that's really where we are as a nation and particularly in Oklahoma now. Um, looking at a, a study of uh, annals, we find that obesity and diabetes travel together. So the portions of Oklahoma currently have 40 to 50% of the population living with diabetes. And that's huge. 
As obesity increases, we know that's only going to worsen. Uh, this was a study on uh, that low-fat vegan diet that improves glycemic control and cardiovascular risk factors. This was a very good randomized control trial in patients with type 2 diabetes. 99 type 2 diabetic patients were randomized to vegan diet versus the ADA. The ADA is the normal diet we usually assign our patients to. Uh, it's considered the industry standard. They evaluated these patients at ba baseline and at 22 weeks, the A1C fell 1.23% in patients on a whole food plant-based diet compared to only 0.38% in the ADA diet group, which was statistically significant at the 0.01 level. Body weight decreased 6.5 kilos in the whole food plant-based diet group and only 3.1 kilos in the ADA diet patients a difference of less than 0.001 significance. The LDL cholesterol fell 21% in the whole food plant-based diet group versus 10% in the ADA, ADA group, a difference of 0.02. Additionally, urinary, al urinary albumin reductions were greater in the whole food plant-based group. So we can see that this whole issue of diet's really important. There's gonna be different uh, diets out there that your patients will be able to tolerate or be able to participate in but they're really critical. And it does look like, uh, as the, uh, the recommendations say, moving towards a whole food diet is gonna be probably better for our patients overall. So this was all cause mortality associated with protein sources. And you can kind of compare the plant sources, the poultry, fish, unprocessed meat, eggs, and processed meat, and that rate of mortality. <clears throat> the next one is the physical activity getting our patients to 150 minutes a week. So thinking about if they uh, exercise five days a week and 30 minutes a day, um, strength training increases tolerated into structured pro programs, wearable technologies. A lot of people are using Fitbits now. Medical evaluation clearance for some of our patients who are morbidly obese and don't maybe have all the endurance that they, the others will have and uh, even medically supervised uh, uh, exercise as well. So I was also glad to see and uh, that the uh, AACE recognized that issue that a lot of our patients with severe obesity and diabetes um, have very poor sleep because they have sleep apnea. So these people really ought to be getting screened for sleep apnea with the home sleep study, <clears throat> where they're just checking the oxygen saturation at night and referral to a sleep lab. For behavioral support, um, community engagement is gonna be critical for people. A lot of times they become very disengaged from the community, particularly when they have severe obesity. And that issue of alcohol moderation, discussing mood with the, uh, with, with the, uh, the HCP and, and formal behavioral therapy uh, can be very important. They also have put a priority on no tobacco products. We know that the two combined uh, the smoking along with the diabetes are going to be uh, terrible. Um, in terms of the modulation of tensiness of glucose lowering, Dr. Chalmers was just talking about this. Dr. Chalmers, any thoughts on this particular graph here on in the different uh, disease duration, life expectancies, things like that that you've seen? Uh, you may be on mute. Uh oh. Um. Yeah, I mean, I definitely, the better the control is, you know, and the better they can do it with lifestyle and dietary changes rather than having to add additional expensive medications, I think the better they do. And actually, you know, I think when a patient's able to do it with dietary and lifestyle, they feel better and typically are prouder than, you know, having to add a medication to do it. <clears throat> Now we're gonna move into this uh, seemingly very complex looking uh, graphic. The endocrinologist put together though this useful guide for managing glucose lowering medications in type two diabetes. And we're gonna walk through each part of it. Uh, we'll try to take it pretty quickly because I think we're getting down to our last 15 minutes. Um, it takes into consideration the patient's individual risk related to cardiovascular disease, congestive heart failure, and chronic kidney disease. And it's adapted from Davies and colleagues work while at first glance, it looks overwhelming. Let's take it one step at a time. So that first line therapy is metformin and comprehensive lifestyle management for all patients. <clears throat> the 
the next thing is we walk through, you see that first line up there, the next thing, indicators of high risk or established cardiovascular disease. So that's the first thing we're gonna be asking. So considering independently of baseline, the A1C or individualized A1C target, the A, the, if the patient has a high cardiovascular disease risk, we're gonna be on the left. If heart failure or chronic kidney disease predominates, we're gonna be on the right side. And these are the new medicines that have come out that really uh, at first had me a bit baffled a few years ago. And so trying to figure out which ones I needed to use and which ones were in which category weren't always easy. But the GLP-1 RA group on, on the left, um, Dr. Chalmers, you wanna walk us through this as, as, as the benefits and, and what, what that's about? Yeah, I mean, so the, you know, I talk about them in the part that I was going to go over, but they're really good because they help lower glucose, they help with um, maintaining weight, and for the most part, they can either be given once a day or once a week and can be very beneficial with lowering the A1C and tightening up that um, glucose. And for the most part, after the beginning initiation, um, some pa patients have a little bit of nausea with it. Once that subsides, for the most part, they're pretty tolerable. So they've been pretty helpful. And take us through on the SGL2 inhibitors and what you've seen on that. So I, I mean, both of these medicines I really like and I thought, you know, have been very beneficial. I did have concerns when the SGL2 inhibitors came out because of, you know, what's going on with this kidney when you're spilling so much glucose over time, but they seem to have been really beneficial. They do help lower the A1C. The one thing that there isn't a lot of guidelines out there, um, but when I've talked with other endocrinologists, we typically try not to start that medication when they're too poorly controlled just because of the risk factors or the side effects that are associated with that medication. So, you know, if I was to get someone who had an A1C of 12, I probably would hold off on using that as second line treatment until I got blood sugars, you know, slightly better controlled. But I think for patients who do not, you know, have an A1C around eight, it's a fantastic drug. Great. And so, uh, just as again, that if the cardiovascular disease predominates, we're going to be on starting for our second drug over on the left. If the heart failure or chronic disease predominates, looking at more on the right side with the SGLT2 inhibitors. I've actually just taken my board exam again, and these are showing up on the new board exams for those who will be taking the board soon. Um, let's touch base real quick then on the DPP4 inhibitors and the TZDs and what's their place. Uh, you wanna talk a little bit about that, Dr. Chalmers? Sure, so I mean, the DPP4 inhibitors came out be before the GLP-1 um, receptor agonists and they're good for help lowering the A1 C, they're simple, they're once a day, um, but their A1C risk um, reduction is usually about um, a half to 1%. Um, but, you know, minimal side effects as long as kidney function is good. So, I mean, it's a good option, especially if someone has needle phobia. Um, now, when it comes to like Actos and Avandia, I don't use those drugs a lot um, because typically of the associated weight gain that goes with it. But if I have someone who has pretty significantly elevated triglycerides, I do like using those medications and they're, you know, relatively inexpensive. You brought up the issue about uh, weight and weight loss and weight gain. Uh, I, one, of the, one of the board questions was really focused on the liraglutide uh, and the fact that the, on, the, on the GLP-1 uh, RA medications, we see more weight loss in these patients. Is that something that you've seen in practice? Yes, you do get more weight loss with the and actually, liraglutide is also marketed as Sexenda, which is actually used for prediabetes for weight loss, but at higher doses. The biggest issue with that, of course, is cost and then getting it approved through your insurance company, but it has been beneficial. Okay, so glucose lowering medications, uh, we're going to be going over to the other, uh, the next part of this, which is 
the, when you have a compelling need to minimize hypoglycemia. And so um, walking through this, uh, the, you know, as they say, the initial combination therapy uh, should be considered in patients presenting with A1, A1C levels 1.5 to 2% above target because most medications rarely decrease A1C concentrations by more than 1%. Data does exist to support initial combination therapy. This approach may be superior to starting metformin and waiting to add an additional medicine. The choice of a new medicine to add to metformin should be individualized, selecting a medication from one of these categories, and the four classes are the least likely to lead to hypoglycemia as well. Uh, again, a DPP-4 inhibitor and a GLP-1 receptor agonist should not be used together. Um, can you talk a little bit about what you've uh, seen in terms of uh, starting patients on initial combination therapy? And secondly, uh, that issue about the DPP-4 inhibitor and GLP-1 not being used together. So when you give a GLP-1, um, you actually it already overwhelms the receptor so much that you don't need the DPP-4 inhibitor. And so it's not even, you know, it's not effective. Um, what we have recommended though, is when you're on a DPP-4 inhibitor and you want to go to a um, GLP-1 receptor agonist to continue the DPP-4 inhibitor to make sure that they tolerate the GLP-1 receptor agonist. And once they tolerate it, then you can go ahead and stop it. That's a good tip. Um, and in terms of uh, the uh, compelling need to minimize the hypoglycemia, um, is there, and, and, and using combination therapy, is, is there a combination therapy that you like to begin when you have a patient that's been referred to you? Um, so typically I'll use metformin and then based on whether, you know, needle phobic um, or contraindications, I typically go to the GLUT2 inhibitors or the GLP-1. You know, of course, with the media, the patients a lot of times have some ideas about different medications that may be out there and will bring it up and want to talk about it. Um, you know, but definitely if needle phobic, which for the most part they get over, you know, with using a GLP-1 receptor agonist, um, the GLUT2 inhibitors are usually pretty easy to use. Um, and then on this issue about the compelling need to minimize weight gain or promote weight loss, uh, as we were talking about um, that issue about the GLP-1 RAs, and if that A1C is above target, uh, having them on one of both those. So fairly soon after, within three months, a patient might come in, uh, uh, might, you might have a patient on three different medications. Would that be right, Doc? Correct. Yes, yeah. sometimes even more. <laughs> yeah. All right, and that issue about, uh, as you said, you don't usually use the TZDs or the sulfonylureas very often anymore, but for patients who have cost is a major issue, if they're paying for it out of pocket, don't have a lot of uh, other coverage, that may be important for them to be able to use these. Correct. Um, and then that whole issue about, now we're into talking about quadruple therapy uh, is required uh, and, the uh, regimen with the lowest risk of weight gain. So preferably uh, the, D the DPP-4 may be the fourth one that is added. Um, and if not tolerated or contraindicated because they're already on the GLP-1, a cautious addition of the sulfonylurea, the TZD, and then we're gonna start talking about basal insulin. So it, it, it is an issue of intensifying to injectable therapies. In other words, we may not start them on injectables at first, uh, but then we're gonna be intensifying up to that. Um, so do you wanna walk through, uh, Dr. Chalmers, what you would be doing and seeing uh, on this graph with your patients on uh, leading to insulin? So typically, you know, if they're on the, those, you know, the oral medications and they're not at target, then typically what I'll try to do is start a basal insulin with them just to make it as simple as possible to try to keep them on board. Because, you know, having this be the third or the fourth or possibly the fifth medication, it can be very, you know, complicated. And so typically I'll start the basal insulin. Um, but you want to be careful if you do start the basal insulin to make sure that they know 
um, you know, they're monitoring their blood sugar because with the GLP-1 receptor agonists and the, you know, the SGL-2 inhibitors, they are more likely to have lower blood sugars. Um, and so, you know, typically starting dose, you know, like it says on here, about 10 units, um, depending on, you know, their size, I may go a little bit higher, um, but I usually start, you know, 10 to 20 units a day. And typically I'll use, you know, the long acting insulin. Of course, if cost is an issue, I would use NPH, but I try to minimize that as much as possible just because of the way that peaks. And, you know, with basal insulins, they should not really have a peak where the NPH will, and you want to just be cautious of that and not have them having, you know, hypoglycemia in the middle of the night. Perfect. So this is uh, looking at the uh, adding prandial insulin. Uh, if the patient is still not controlled, uh, what percentage of the patients that you see, uh, you know, you're seeing the toughest of the toughest are going to, with type 2 diabetes, require both a basal as well as a prandial insulin solution? I would say probably 50% or more of the patients, you know, that I end up seeing um, are on basal bolus insulin. And a lot of times my goal is to work with them and try to hopefully reduce the basal bolus insulin by getting them on some of the newer medicines if they're not on them. Um, but it, a large percentage of patients are on that. Um, the biggest thing to remember though, when you do start um, bolus insulin with meals is to stop the sulfonylurea because if they're needing insulin at meal times, the sulfonylurea should be stopped because they're obviously not producing enough insulin, which is the, you know, what sulfonylureas are doing is causing insulin secretion. Go ahead and get rid of that. Good point, thank you. So, if you've heard of the Choosing Wisely campaign, uh, you're aware of a wide variety of recommendations. Here's a couple that they include. Do not medicate to achieve tight glycemic control in older adults. Moderate control is generally better, and that's a recommendation from the American Geriatric Society. And do not use sliding scale insulin for long-term diabetes management for individuals residing in the nursing home. And boy, I remember when I was a young doc, uh, all the patients that seemed like in the nursing home were getting a lot of in, sliding, sliding scale insulins in the nursing home. And that's from the American Medical Directors Association. So a couple of good, uh, good ideas. Also, the Society of General Medicine reminds us not to use daily home finger glucose testing in diabetes type 2 not using insulin. In other words, your patient's not using insulin it really isn't important that you be checking the blood sugar on a regular daily basis. That being said, there's going to be some times that Dr. Chalmers, I suspect, is going to ask the patients to check their blood sugars during the day so she knows what's going on. Do you want to have any comment about that, Dr. Chalmers? Yeah, you know, I think, you know, yes, not daily, but to, you know, be doing it several times a week just so that they're kind of aware of where their trends are and, you know, is are my blood sugars starting to run higher than they used to? Do I need to be concerned about this? Do I need to make some modifications? Typically what I try to do is have them kind of rotate, maybe check a fasting one day, you know, a lunchtime or a dinner time or a bedtime and kind of do that, you know, several times a week and rotate it so they can kind of see where they run and also see what happens, you know, when they're eating, how that affects their blood sugar. Um, I'm going to stop now and give you an opportunity to share uh, your slides, uh, if we can do that. Yeah. I can see it. Okay. Um, let me just... I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to be able to get the video of me, but that's fine. Um, oh, here we go. I can do that. Um, so I just wanted to go over the DPP-4 inhibitors, the GLUT2, um, the SGL2, and the uh, GLP-1 inhibitors, just to kind of go over them because there's just some little caveats, and a lot of times you may not have the ability to pick which one you want based on insurance, but if you have the ability, then, you know, pick one that may be more beneficial for your patient. Um, and then some things to follow up with on them. So DPP-4 inhibitors came out probably around 2007, 2008. Um, and um, 
are good. So what they do is they increase endogenous GLP-1 and they stimulate glucose dependent insulin secretion from the beta cells. And so that leads to lower glucagon secretion, which leads to lower hepatic glucose output. Um, I'm not sure. Oh, sorry. Okay, so there are actually five, I don't have one on here, of the DPP-4 inhibitors. And these are all oral and they're all given once a day um, for the most part, unless they put them in a combination medication. So a lot of these um, are out um, added to metformin, which can make it easier for the patient to take it. Um, but there's uh, Trigenta, Ungliza, Genuvia, and Galvis. And then there is one generic, um, Alogliptin, that is out. Um, and so a caveat on the saxagliptin, um, it is recommended um, to decrease the dose if the GFR is less than 50. And so normal dose is five milligrams and you bring down th that down to 2.5. And so it's important to make sure you do monitor their GFR um, one to two times a year when they're on this medication. The one thing though to think about this, um, the study showed that there is a increased risk of hospitalization for heart failure on saxagliptin, um, 3.5 versus 2.8. Um, placebo. And so it's recommended on patients who do have heart failure not to use saxagliptin. Um, linagliptin um, is one, it's, which is Tragenta. I like it, especially if someone has a lower um, GFR because there is no adjustment. So once they're started, they remain on the five milligram indefinitely. Um, and this one did show in the leader study, um, lower three-point MACE, which is primary major adverse cardiac events, so which is cardiac death, um, non-fatal MI or non-fatal um, stroke. And so it was slightly lower using linagliptin. So, I mean, for the medicine, if you're using it, um, especially in someone who has chronic kidney disease and diabetes, it's nice to know that you may slightly prevent risk of these cardiac complications, which is usually why patients with diabetes die. Um, and it is indicated as an adjunct to diet and exercise with diabetes and to reduce risk of major cardiovascular events in adults with diabetes who have established cardiovascular disease. Um, and then in elderly, what's nice about this medication is it does have some studies showing if you have someone who's on basal bolus insulin, um, but their mealtime insulin is less than 10 units per meal, you can consider replacing um, the basal, in, or sorry, the bolus insulin with linagliptin, and this will decrease the risk of hypoglycemia in these patients. Dr. Chalmers, I have a few questions on here when you get a chance uh, that people have sure. asked, and we're almost out of time. Okay. Do you want to do that, or can I just um, do one, one thing um, yes. about, just quickly about the GLP-1 receptor agonist? Yes, please. Those at this point are contraindicated with a history of type 1 or DKA. Um, pancreatitis, gastroparesis, and gallstones. Gallstones isn't really mentioned, but if you have a patient who has gallstones, you want to be really careful with those medications. Um, there's not a lot of data about renal impairment or acute um, kidney injury with these medications. Usually, if I'm going to put someone on it, I do discuss with their nephrologist prior to doing that. And then, of course, um, if triglycerides are greater than 500, typically um, don't really start um, GLP-1 receptor agonists. And then the one thing that there isn't a lot out there at, if you're going to put someone on Ozempic, which is semaglutide, um, they need I exams because they have higher risk of developing or progressing, um, having progressive retinopathy. Um, it's not with the oral, but with the injectable one. Okay, the first question comes from Dr. Duffy. Dr. Chalmers, are you managing a number of child or adolescent type 2 diabetes patients, and do pediatricians use diabetes prevention actions? I think with, you know, probably about one in four to one in five of our new onset diabetes is type 2. Um, used to be none, um, but it's probably about one in four, one in five, and I would say most Patients who have type 1 or type 2 in children are usually referred to our center, and then we put them into our program here. Thanks. And coming from Dr. Mould, who's the godfather of OFIC, 
from an implementations perspective, is there evidence that emphasizing healthy behaviors, specifically for those with prediabetes, produces better meaningful outcomes in morbidity, mortality, and cost than emphasizing those behaviors for all patients? I'm not convinced that adverse psychological impact of labeling patients with prediabetes is justified based only upon reducing the risk of developing diabetes. What, what are your also, thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, not only, so most of the patients who we see who we follow for prediabetes, not only do they have prediabetes, but they also usually have borderline or hypertension. Usually cholesterol or triglycerides is abnormal. Some of them already have sleep apnea. So not only are they having prediabetes, but they have all the other you know, comorbidities that go along with obesity. Um, and from Dr. Crawford, uh, maybe if you could summarize in one to two sentences, how to choose which GLP-1 or SGL-2 medication? So if I typically go for Jardians the first, because that's the one that I've um, used the most. Um, and for most of my patients, they've tolerated it well. It has, you know, with Invacana, it has the risk of lower extremity amputation. Um, so I try to avoid that. GLP-1, um, I like Victoza, except it's daily. Um, and I like Trulicity. Those are the ones that I've had the most experience with. Um, and I like Ozempic that it's able to be given once a week. The problem with that is have, making sure they get appropriate eye exams. We don't know, you know, is four weeks you know, too long to be on it without an eye exam. Right now we say try to do one within eight weeks, but that's not always possible. So I hate to put a patient on a medicine where I may make their eye disease worse. Good. Uh, and I, I think what the Dr. Jelly uh, has asked, uh, M Marty Jelly has asked, I have a question about access to diabetes education for our adult patients here at OU. And let me just, uh, I, I'm going to suppose what she's asking is, are you having any trouble finding diabetes education for your patients here? I mean, we have our educators here, but like for patients being referred just for diabetes education, you know, I think we don't have a good program in place for that. And that would be something that we could work on as a center is, you know, being able to have a good just diabetes care and prevention program with education. For those uh, who are affiliated with OPIC that are watching this, uh, we're wrapping up, but one of the things uh, that we will be working with your offices on is working to help identify those pre-diabetes programs that are out there, the di diabetes management education support and medication therapy management, and working with you to help uh, smooth that process of referral so that it makes it easier. So that's one of our main goals in presenting this to you, as well as just kind of the updates on the new medications, their value, where they might be used. I'm glad you took time to uh, be with us this afternoon. Um, our, our time is up, but please don't hesitate to send emails uh, my way or Dr. Chalmers ways with questions you might have. And we're really glad we got to uh, spend time with you on this. Thank you. And so this is Blake Leslaroth, and I want to add my, my sincere gratitude to both Dr. Beasley, Dr. Chalmers, a, an amazing talk that covered an, an enormous amount of information on a, on a topic that's becoming increasingly complex and sometimes difficult to keep up on the guidelines and best practice standards. Uh, we've recorded this session so that we will be able to rebroadcast, and I certainly hope both Dr. Beasley and Chalmers will consider joining us again in the future because I think we have so much to learn. And, and it seems like almost like we've only scratched the surface today, but thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Blake.